Turn, if you would, in your Bibles this morning to the 145th Psalm. I'm going to need control of this for just the next few minutes. There we go. All right. Psalm chapter number 145. Going to stand and read just one verse, if you would, with me this morning. Verse number 20. Psalm 145, verse number 20. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. Our Father and our God, we are thankful to you this morning just for so many things. Just the beautiful day you've given us, the life you've given us today, another uh, gift of your mercy and your grace towards us and your long suffering towards us to show us the favor you've shown us today and just pray that you might be among us in a powerful way, that the preaching of your word would be effectual, Lord, not necessarily through the preacher, but by the work of your spirit in the hearts of your people. I pray that that might be the case this morning to the glory and the honor and praise of Jesus Christ, and we ask it in his name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I want to talk to you this morning about uh, something that ties in a little bit with what we've been discussing over the past several uh, months, and especially building off of what we talked about last Sunday morning. The idea is the idea of being a lover of God. So we are going to explore this idea a little bit more particularly today. And I wanted to start by calling your attention to this verse in the psalm to look at a, uh, an idea that we've also discussed recently, which is antithetical parallelism, right? So that's what we have going on in this verse. We have two ideas that are shown that are antithetical to each other. And so the first half of the verse says, The Lord preserveth all them that love him. And then we're told antithetically to that, but the opposite of that is that all of the wicked will he destroy. So as we look at this psalm and we consider what's being contrasted, we see preserving and destroying. Those are clearly opposites, right? On the one case, there's a group of people that will be preserved by God. In the other case, there's a group of people who are to be destroyed by God. Now, we're all familiar with the concept of God's love. That's probably one of the most um, broadly spoken of topics in our time today. A topic that is less comfortable uh, and certainly less discussed is God's hatred. Uh, you don't hear a lot about God's hatred. And it's a difficult concept to even discuss or to think about or to contemplate. But we necessarily need to understand that the tendency of us as creatures is to change the truth of God and make it into a lie. And so when we take the, what God has revealed of himself in his word and we change it, we have taken and exchanged the truth of who God is for a lie about who God is. And I think there's nowhere where that's more obvious than in this idea of the love of God. So we, we could explore that in a lot of ways. But this morning, I want to focus less on God's love towards creation I want to focus on a really particular aspect of what God demands from his creation. Because all of the promises that we see in scripture are not to those necessarily whom God loves, but those who reciprocate his love and are made specifically to a group of people that are identified chiefly, the chief characteristic of all those to whom these promises uh, will be affirmed are those who love him. And so when we look at the work of uh, the Holy Spirit and the preaching of the gospel and the work of Christ, and we understand what God is accomplishing in the hearts of his people, uh, this is one point that I think is worthy of some time to look at and understand. And we will see this over and over and over again in scripture, that we have this idea of preservation and destruction but also these two groups, namely those that love him and the wicked. So it might be uh, tempting to always think of 
the wicked and the opposite being what? The righteous. And that's true. But in this case, we see that the wicked is contrasted with its opposite, which is what? Those who love God. So to hate God is wicked. To love God is righteous. Those who love God, those who are righteous in his sight, will be preserved. And those who hate God are wicked in his sight and will be destroyed. So this psalm really helps us begin to put a little more around this understanding and this idea of uh, those to whom these promises are made. Both of, uh, by the way, destruction is also a promise, uh, right? God has promised to do this. Uh, so we have here the love of God, uh, but also our reciprocation of that love. And it's in that mind and that context, I want you to turn in your Bibles to the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. Book of Ephesians chapter number one, a passage that we've visited now a couple of times to continue to add more understanding to uh, the particular statements that are made by the Apostle Paul in this letter to this church at Ephesus. And so we were open up in verse number three with blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So a couple of things are happening. One, the blessing the, that Paul is uh, declaring is to God and then he's about to go on to list all the reasons why we bless the name of God right because it's God who has done all these things and so he's about to list all those for us secondly he tells us exactly the God he's speaking of when he says the father of our Lord Jesus so this is something that is particular uh, about God that it's not just God generally, but very specifically, the God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in this context, he says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now we're going to talk this morning a little bit more about some of those spiritual blessings, and we've discussed them already a little bit in previous weeks, right? We've understood now that repentance and faith and love and any of the uh, outward workings of obedience to the commandments of God are, are what bears witness to the fact that we are a new creature. When you think about spiritual gifts, you think about uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, when Paul's talking to the church at Corinth, specifically about spiritual gifts. And at the conclusion of that, um, discussion, that dialogue, he says what? Now abideth these three. Faith, hope, and what? Charity. And he's talking about spiritual what? Gifts. These are things that are given to us in Christ Jesus. So we have faith, hope, and charity, or love, or the Greek word agape, that unconditional love of God. And he says that the greatest of all these is what? Charity. If there's one identifying mark that is common to all of God's children, it is supremely this, their love of God. Now, as we know uh, from the scriptures, and we can look at a few places, what we're told here, everyone that loveth him that begat, which speaks of God the Father, Loveth him also that is begotten of him, which is who? The Son. So to be a lover of God and to be a lover of Christ is synonymous in the truth. Because if you love God, you will love Christ. That's what the apostles labored to teach so that people could understand that there is a, uh, there are um, some peculiarities to the exactness of, uh, of the nature of the true and living God. That in fact, Jesus Christ, his son, is the one whom we love because he was begotten of the Father. And by receiving the Son, we receive the Father. By loving the Son, we love the Father. So what does all that have to do with us this morning? 
Because in our hearts, one of the most poignant examinations that can be made by someone claiming to be a child of God is chiefly this, when we ask ourselves this question, do I love Christ? And while on the surface that sounds like something that's simple to answer, it is one of the most poignant and meaningful self-examinations a child of God can make. To be very honest with ourselves and say, do I love Jesus Christ? Because if the scriptures present it to us this way, all those who are unregenerate cannot love God. And all those who are regenerate can't not love God. And all who do love God are therefore regenerate. And those who do not love God are not regenerate. These, these two groups that we've just seen in Psalm 145 are so exclusive of one another that the most apparently obvious way that they are manifest is in the love they have for Christ. So that is obvious through the New Testament, which makes the statement of Jesus Christ when he's talking to the religious leaders of the Jews, and he looks them right in the eye and he says, but I know you that you have not the love of God in you. That is such a strong indictment against very religious people, against people who had the scriptures, against people who had the knowledge of the truth, who had a form of godliness, and yet, Jesus Christ pronounces judgment against them in these very strong words, I know you, that you do not have the love of God. So as we examine ourselves, one of the most important examinations we can make as a child of God is to allow the Holy Spirit to ask us that question. Are you a lover of Jesus Christ? And there's some ways that Scripture has given us. Of course, the Lord has not left us to make that examination on our own. He's far too good of a Savior and of a God to leave us to our own devices. But he has equipped us to ask these very questions. And so when we, especially bringing up young people, I want to speak to the young people for a moment. There's a lot of young people who grow up and make professions of faith. Right? They grow up with the knowledge. They grow up with the tools. They grow up with the word. They have this in their minds. Right? And then they look back in their life and they say, well, I know I'm saved because this event happened in my youth. While it's important to understand when you first believed, the, the tools that we are given in Scripture for examining ourselves are still necessary to the walk of faith. And chiefly, the first and foremost is, as you grow in your maturity in this life, in your physical maturity, does your love for Christ grow deeper and richer and truer, or do you grow more and more distant from him? Because it is the chief way that God's people are known is by their love for Christ. Amen. Not by the fact that you came forward in a service. Not by the fact that you said a prayer. Not by the fact that you... What did Paul say? If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Well, what is it that the Spirit of Christ gives us? Well, the very first fruit that we're told he gives us is love. And not just the, you know, romanticized version of love that we're so familiar with from the world. Uh, if there's been a topic that's been more diluted and, and uh, destroyed in our minds as to what it means, it's the very word love in our modern world. Because it's celebrated by the world uh, in all the ways that are, that are contrary to the true love that God speaks about in his word. Uh, every time I go to United, I don't know when they've done this, they've recently or sometime uh, in the past changed their music selection. It used to just be kind of a very you know, benign, generic, you know, musical type music playing in the background. At some point they changed it to where now it's actually, there's lyrics. And 
the selections of the world's music continue to fascinate the mind because they're for the most part void and meaningless. Uh, they don't actually say anything substantive. But the, the recurring theme that I hear as I'm shopping and trying to ignore the music is this idea of love that they celebrate, but the way they celebrate it is contrary to the true meaning of love. If you go to 1 Corinthians 13 and read about true love, uh, it is not what the world is talking about. And so there's a very deliberate attempt to destroy the meaning of this word in our minds. But as we understand what the Apostle Paul is saying, that we've been blessed with these spiritual blessings, that chiefly among those blessings are faith, hope, and love, and among those three that are common to all of God's children, right? There's a diversity of gifts that the Spirit gives to everyone according as he will, dividing to every man severally as he will. But there are three that are common to all God's children, which are faith and hope and love, and the chiefest of those three is love. So of all the things the saints of God have in common, the chiefest principle among all of them is love. Love of Christ. And by extension, love for the brethren, because Christ dwells in them. Right? So you cannot escape the reality of this, and that's what the apostle goes on to say. He says in verse number 4, According as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world. And then he uses the word that, right? So he's about to give us the purpose of God and all of these things that he's just said that God has done. So God has done these things. He's given us these spiritual blessings and he's chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. To what end? What is the purpose of God in all that he's done? He goes on to tell us that we should be holy and without blame before him, the next two words, in love. Now, if we understand anything from the Apostle Paul's teaching, uh, and John, he talks about this a lot as well, is that we have known, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. And because he loved us first, we have loved him. Right? There's this reciprocal nature to the love that we have for Christ. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying, that we should be perfect before him in love. Now, that is a big idea. The idea is this, that if you loved Christ perfectly, you would obey him perfectly. So what, to what purpose does God have in calling out his elect from the world and quickening them, making them alive together with Christ, sending the spirit of his son into their hearts. The main idea is to bring us to full maturity where we're in a perfect relationship with him in love. At the point that that is true of us, there's no need for any other law. That's why, why uh, Paul says that Christ is the end of the law for everyone that believes. Because we've been brought into a relationship where we love him. It is not possible to be a Christian and not love Christ. This is the Apostle Paul's idea in the book of Romans when he's teaching the segregation of these two groups. That to be in Christ is to love him. And to not love him is to not be in him. And so there is no middle road where uh, we think that there's some the gray area, Paul's saying, if you don't love Christ, you're not in Christ. Now, we all need to love him more, Amen. which is the progression of the Christian growth and experience in this life. And that's what Paul's saying that he's doing. You know, if husbands loved Christ more, they'd be better husbands. Amen. If fathers loved Christ more, they'd be better fathers. If mothers loved Christ more, they'd be better wives and mothers. I mean, all of these things work together, but are fulfilled mainly in the idea of loving Christ. When children do not honor their parents, it's because they don't love Christ enough. When, when we fail to meet our responsibilities and obligations to each other, it's because not only the love for each other is waxing cold, 
But mainly, if the love for our brother is waxing cold, it is because our love for Christ is not what it ought to be. So all of those things work together, but they chiefly key off of our love for Christ. And so as the body of Christ, as saints of God, as members of Christ, one of the things that we should always be challenging ourselves with is this idea of my love for Christ. If we go back to the exercise of the will and we draw on a little bit of the lessons that we had there, this is the main idea. Whenever we exercise our will in the act of making any choice, right? I mean, everybody that got up today, you had to make a choice. You had to make a lot of choices. Even when getting to church was one thing, but how you're going to involve with the service, how you're going to engage with your brothers and sisters in Christ, how you're going to use or not use your countenance to build others up or to bring them down, how you're going to use your body language, how you're going to use your voice to praise the one who saved your soul. All of these choices we make, many of them, unfortunately, unconsciously, but in every instance, the exercise of will is choosing, and the choice is simply love for Christ or love of something else. It's really that simple. And what Christ is saying and what the apostles teach is that for those who have his spirit, that the exercise of the will needs to become habitually, I love Christ. Amen. I'm choosing Christ. I'm loving Christ. And in every area, my opinion and view of Christ is higher and higher and higher until he dominates my thinking, Amen. dominates my priorities, and my life literally to live is Christ. Amen. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. And that's only possible when we begin to understand that in every instance we choose something else, we are not loving Christ. These things are not agreeable. The flesh and the spirit Sorry, the spirit and the flesh. I've been using this over here for Christ. So the spirit and the flesh, they're not agreeable with one another. The things your flesh wants to do is because it hates God. The things your flesh wants for itself is because it is a hater of God. It is enmity with God. It is not at peace with God, and it is not a lover of God. So the new creature that we are in Christ is called just as a little child comes out of the womb that child only loves the child it has no love for the parents it has no love for the world it only wants the things that serve its interest so just as we as little children in christ we don't know how to love him as we ought to we don't know how to love him the way that he deserves to be loved for the life that he has given us and for the provision that he has made for our souls we don't know those things as little children, but in time, when the relationship is functioning as it ought, we come to realize the love that we have for our parents, and we love them because they loved us first. And so that reciprocal love that grows and grows and grows bears witness to what's actually taking place in the heart. The heart is deceitful, so our own verbal testimony can lie to us. John tells us in his epistle over and over, if a man says this, but this is true about him, he's a liar. So the witness testimony of the mouth is not enough, but one chief testimony that we see over and over again, and Paul states here very clearly, is the purpose of God and bringing many sons to glory is so that we could be perfected in this relationship with him in love. His love for us is already perfect. What is happening for his children is we are growing and being perfected in our love for him. So every time you have a choice to make, whether it's arguing with your wife, arguing with your spouse, arguing with your fellow church member, uh, and you see church splits happen and all these other kind of ugly things that unfold on the earth and among God's people where it ought not be the case, you know why those things manifest themselves? Because people are hating God and loving themselves. When we love God, we will listen to his counsel. Perfect love is perfect obedience. So we can continue to study this idea out in scripture and see what Christ teaches. Because remember, he's equipping his apostles. And in John number 14, he's teaching them as he's about to go away. 
He's equipping them for the ministry he's going to give to them. And that ministry is a gospel ministry of preaching and looking for and examining and paying attention to the responses in the hearts of the people. And there's a really interesting question that's asked in that chapter uh, when the Lord is asked, how is it that you will manifest yourself unto us and not unto the world? And we're going to look at that a little more closely. But in that moment, Christ is teaching them that when you're dealing with people and you're teaching and you're preaching the gospel and you're discipling, one of the things you're looking for is whether or not the person keeps my sayings. The person that keeps my sayings, Christ says, it's that guy that loves me. Now, he's not teaching that only for their own benefit, but as the apostles who would be first set in the church and continue to carry out the gospel ministry, that was important for them to know. That they might understand how to pastor and lead and shepherd and oversee the work of God. So they're looking for people who are interested in what Christ had to say. This is, uh, I hope, at least been set up in this early uh, moments of this service that it's understood how important this idea is. Let's go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 1 before we go to John 14. In verse number 12, Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious? But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and what? Love which is in Christ Jesus. So what does Paul attribute the presence of an abundance of faith and an abundance of love in his life? He attributes that to the grace of the Lord. He says, the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and with love. And where is that faith and love? Where does it come from? From whose treasury are those riches dispensed? From the treasury of Christ. Right? And so this is the spiritual blessings that Paul's talking about in Ephesians that we've been blessed with. The abundance of his riches and goodness toward us. Right? So Paul's saying that the faith that he had and the love that he had received, he had received by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that was given to him out of the Lord's own abundance and richness. And so that's an important thing I think that we should at least latch on to as well to understand that these gifts that we receive from Christ, as we've, as we've said, that the work of the Spirit of God to regenerate and to quicken an individual, and then all of the gifts that he gives us, faith, hope, and love, and everything else, is a manifestation, a witness to the new creature. So now if we go back to John chapter number 14 and look at this conversation that Christ is having with his apostles, a really interesting uh, dialogue back and forth. One of the most insightful um, passages of scripture that we have into the intimate dialogue between Christ and his apostles in this kind of way as he's teaching and going back and forth with them, answering their questions. Uh, and it gives us a little bit of an insight into the experience of, that the apostles had with Christ during this time. If we pick up our reading in verse number 21, he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now that's an important doctrine to think about. Because as we're going to continue to see throughout the entirety of the New Testament, and as we've already seen in Psalm 145, the promises of Christ are affirmed to those who love him. So in this moment, Christ is giving really clear teaching. Saying, hey, do you want to know if you're a lover of Christ? Here's how you can know. 
He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. Now, one of the things that tangentially I need to at least speak to is how do we know the sayings of Christ? We know them through the teaching of the apostles. Right? Over and over again, Paul says, this is the commandment of the Lord. So Christ commissioned the apostles and gave them authority and said, hey, go teach everyone everything I've said. Yeah, it's a lot. So when we read the New Testament from the apostles, we're getting the word that was committed to us as commissioned to us from the holy apostles. So the apostles gave us the testimony concerning the sayings of Christ. This is the commandments of the Lord. So we're to receive those as authoritative. So what Christ is saying is that the actual demonstration of the one who is a lover of Christ is notably this, that they receive my sayings and keep them. They're interested in pleasing the one who has revealed his will. So if you have a master that you love, and he's made his will known, then isn't the most natural thing to do for a person who loves their master. It's just like David when he said, hey, I wish I had a drink of water from that well in Bethlehem. All he did was make his will known. There's no commandment there. It's just the making his will known. And so what we have from the apostles is the will of our Lord concerning all these things. Christ is saying, namely, the hallmark of the ones who love me are the ones who hear my sayings and keep them. They say, that's what my Lord wants. That's what my Lord gets. Amen. I've now known his will. And the love that I have for him in my heart motivates me, not because the preacher's prodding me, not because mama's putting me on a guilt trip, not because there's any other motivating factor that's externally having to prompt me to obedience, not because of the threat of doom and gloom upon those who are uh, disobedient, but a simple motivation of the love for the Savior that I have in my heart given to me by the Holy Spirit that propels me to go do the will that I've now known Amen. he has for me. Amen. That's what Christ is saying. Yeah. So he's saying that those who love me, this is their testimony. This is, it's, it's the difference between people who say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything I can't. And the difference between people who say, I want to know what my Lord wants for my life. Yeah. I want to know what the Lord Jesus Christ desires from me. And so all of the other things that the apostles taught, all the way down to submit yourselves to those who have the rule over you, pray for authorities, be obedient to your masters, all of these things that are outcroppings into every area of our life, every area of our experience, flow from a heart that is motivated to love the Savior. That's why Paul says, do everything you do as unto Christ. So the question remains, for us, am I a lover of Christ? And if I'm a lover of Christ, then why is my decision-making not more consistent with the decision-making of one who's a lover of Christ? And it is important for every one of us to not put a, you know, a salve on that wound. You need to let the word of God wound you. Yeah. Amen. And say, you know what? I'm guilty. Amen. I do not love Christ as much as I ought to. But the hallmark of a child of God is they want to love him more. See, the child of the devil is content to okay. I'm content with where I'm at. I'm content to assuage myself that I love him enough. And so the one who assuages himself that I'm good with where I'm at, I don't need to grow anymore. I don't need to serve anymore. I don't need to obey any more than I already am because I'm doing enough already that I'm assuaging the work of the word of God in my life and saying that I'm okay where I'm at and I already love him enough, which is a lie. The mark of a child of God is to admit and agree with God's word. I don't love him like I ought to. 
but I want to love him more. I want to be obedient more. I want to serve him more. And then go to the one from whose treasury those riches can be given. Say, Lord, give me a greater love for you. Give me more faith. Give me a brighter hope. Right? Continue to do the work in me that you've begun. But we need to grow in these areas. So Christ says that he that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He's teaching his disciples how to discern those who are lovers of God. He says, um, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, which, you know, we appreciate the qualification. Scripture doesn't say anything in vain. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. You remember the testimony of the Apostle John when he says, they went out from us because they were not of us. And he says this, if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. What's John doing? He's drawing on the instruction and the lessons that his master had discipled him to use. To say, in the ministry, when you're doing the work of God and preaching the gospel, you're going to need to discern some things. And one of the chief ways to discern someone who comes and wants to be a member of your congregation or wants to get in the door or wants to be a part of the work of God, one of the chief ways you can discern if they are of us or not of us is if they keep his words. Do they continue in the word of Christ? Do they love Christ and keep his sayings? He says, if he loves me, he will keep my words. In other words, how do we know who it is that loves him? It must be a regenerate person. And a regenerate person who's been given the Holy Spirit cannot help but love God. He's been quickened. He's been made alive. He's He's uh, awakened to the knowledge of the truth. He's alive unto God in Christ. He says, and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not does what? Keepeth not my sayings. So what are we to make of people who profess to be believers but have no regard for the will of Christ as revealed to us in scripture? We're to understand that they're lying to us or have deceived themselves and they need to be taught because Jesus Christ makes it very plain that a man that doesn't keep his sayings does not love him. At the very least, we can say that this helps us as a child of God discern between our own two natures. Does it not? The man that doesn't keep his sayings is the old man. And so we can know when the old man is at work in our life because we're not keeping the sayings of Christ. So what are we told of the apostle? Put on the new man. Do it. Use your will you're so proud of and use it well. Don't just be proud that you have one. Use it well. Do something with it, right? Make a good choice. If you're going to make a choice, make a good choice. Put on the new man. Follow the sayings of Christ and exercise yourself in the love of Christ and allow him to grow you in your faith. It says, and the word which ye hear is not mine. This is important as well. Whose word is it? It is the Father's which sent me. What did Christ say? He's sending apostles. He said, whoever sent, receives you, my apostles, receives me because I sent you. And he that receives me receives the one that sent me into the world, which is the Father. And so all these things, according to the testimony of Christ, work together. 
that God sent his son and his son sent his apostles. And those who believe the word of the apostles and follow their sayings and their teachings and receive them as authoritative over my life. In other words, I am not my own, so to speak. I'm bought with a price. And that the writings of the apostles are authoritative over my conduct and over my behavior, but more importantly so, over my thinking, over my affections, over my understanding. So many Christians remain unmoved in their Christian life because they refuse to concede those areas of their life where they have not been personally persuaded to understand why they needed to change. The only reason we need is because Christ commanded his apostles to teach it to us. That's the only reason we need. And so as we exercise ourselves in that, at the root of it, what we need to understand, what is the compulsion of the action? It's the love we have for the Savior who gave his life for us. In Romans 8, 7, we see Christ here talking about love and commandments uh, back and forth uh, so often in this particular chapter. And of course, we know that the carnal mind, how many of the commandments of God can it keep? It can't keep any of them. Right? So the carnal mind, the old creature, cannot keep any of the commandments of God. Can't keep any of the commandments of Christ. They can be religious. They can have a, a form of godliness. But there's no actual power in their life that's the transforming power of the gospel to make them into something they're not. There's only the external force to reform the outside of the man. Right? To whitewash, as Christ says, the outside of the grave. But it's still a tomb. Still dead men's bones. There's no life there. And so Christ is talking about something radically different. Over in John 16, verse number 27, we have the testimony of Christ in this way. For the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me. Now it's it's interesting to think about what Christ is saying. If we, if we look at the uh, entirety of what he's taught, it's tempting to read that verse and think that God loves us because we loved him. But we know from Scripture that can't be the case, don't we? Do we know enough from Scripture to know that we don't love God and then he loves us? So you could read that verse and, and you might be tempted to read it and to think uh, as you read it, the Father loves you because you have loved me. So we know from Scripture that's not the correct understanding of the verse. So what's he saying? He's saying, because you have loved me, you can know the Father has loved you. What is the testimony of those whom the Father has loved? It's manifest because they love his son. So the loving of the son, right? The father himself loves you because you have loved me. The loving of the son bears witness to the love the father has for us. Behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. I know for a fact, not one of us in this room can even understand what that means that we are sons of God <laughs> that's a big statement right it's, it carries a lot with it but scripture tells us that's the case for those who have believed how do we know that the father loves us we will know if the father loves us because we will love his son when we love his son it gives us confidence that the father loves us because who is it that gives us a love for his son it's the work of God in our hearts. So the work of God in our hearts to regenerate the lost and dead man and to quicken him and make him alive in Christ the, by the Holy Spirit that sheds abroad the love of God in our hearts. The fact that we love Christ is what gives us confidence that the Father loves us because we can see the evidence in our life that we love Christ. So again, the question over and over again becomes, are we lovers of Christ? 
Are we lovers of God? So many people today rest themselves in the confidence that God loves them. And that is about the sum of a lot of the preaching that takes place in the world today on behalf of the gospel. It says, well, God loves you. Just rest in that. But the apostles never said that our place in heaven or our place in Christ, that any of those things that give us hope would be assured by the knowledge that God loves us, but that the evidence of the fact that we are loved by God would be manifest because we love him back. And that is not well understood today. If we do not love him back, I was having a conversation some time ago with a young man about this, and he was comforting himself with the idea that he just knows that Jesus loves him, and that, that's all he knows. Uh, so, you know, no matter if he's living with his girlfriend uh, out of marriage, no matter if he's cussing like a sailor, no matter if he ever attends the house of God, no matter if he has anything to do with the saints of God, no matter if he's been separated from the world unto Christ at all, no matter if uh, he ever attends a place uh, of worship that's set up in the name of Christ, no matter how any of those things that are lacking in his life, he continues to comfort himself with the fact that I just know God loves me. But what did we see in Psalm 145? To whom are the promises effectual? To those who love God. Amen. So the question I had for the young man is, I know about God's love for man. What scripture wants to know is how much do you love him? How much do you love Christ? And that's what I'm having a hard time seeing in your life. But the promises of God are to those who love him. And he took a step back, literally. He took a step back. And he said, wow, you're, you're laying some knowledge on me. He's like, I've, I've never heard that. And most people haven't heard that. Yeah. Continuing to cover, what did God say? That the false prophets say, peace, peace to the wicked. But God says, there is no peace to the wicked. And who is wicked but one who hates God? And who is one who hates God but one who hates his son, Jesus Christ? There is no peace to those who hate Jesus Christ. There is no peace to be declared to them. The peace that is promised of God is promised to those who love his son. And how is it that we can know if we love his son? Because we obey his son. That's how scripture lays it out for us. Why? Because God wants us to know uh, that he hates us? No. So we can know we are his enemies because we hate him. That we might be reconciled to him in his son. So the point is that we have to first, before you can understand any good news, you have to know the bad news. And the bad news is nobody by the natural birth comes into this world loving God any more than they love their parents. Some children grow to hate their parents more as they get older. How is it obvious? Because they don't listen to them. They don't obey them. They don't do for them according to the will they know would please them. That is the definition of hatred. And so it's obvious that they grow to hate their parents more. You say, I don't like hearing that. It's painful and difficult. I know. And life is. It gets really real sometimes. It gets really real, which is why the preaching of the truth is absolutely necessary. As children of God, it's evident that we are his sons because we will grow to love him more and more and more. The natural man doesn't know anything about that. The natural man is content to love God as long as he thinks there's something in it for him that he wants. It can be pride, it can be reputation, it can be prestige, it can be position in a religious establishment or a church, you know, being well thought of in the community. Uh, all my friends go to church there. As long as there's something in it for the natural man, the music is great, uh, the worship service is great, uh, you know, the pastor tells good stories, um, 
whatever it is, there's something in it that the natural man craves for himself. But the child of God loves Christ. The natural man cannot understand a love like that, and he cannot be obedient to the command to love like that. Romans 8, 28. Obviously, we all know this. It says, we know that all things work together for good for who? Them that love God. That's who they're going to work good for. They're not going to work together for good for those who hate God and those who hate his son. And how do we know who it is that hates God and hates his son? Because they're called in scripture children of disobedience. That's how we know. They're not obedient to Christ. And it's Paul hammers this home time and time again so that we individually can challenge ourselves with this understanding. Do I love Christ or do I love myself? It's so, so important. Romans 8 makes it plain. 1 Corinthians 2.9 is another well-known passage of scripture that goes right over our heads oftentimes it says as it is written i have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god hath prepared for those he loves it's not what it says for those that love him that's the question that is the root of the matter James 1.12, another famous one, and we'll end with this. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Anybody here hoping for the crown of life? That the, the promise of everlasting life is yours to be had? Who is it promised to? James tells us, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Which is why Christ said, if any man doesn't hate his father or mother or son or daughter, because he must love me. And if he doesn't, he's not worthy of me. I'm thankful that there are difficult family situations in a lot of homes in this church and that people are having to choose Christ or family and that I see evidence that there are those who are of Christ who are choosing Christ choosing to follow Christ it's painful it's difficult Jesus I and mean, we were taught by the Apostle Paul all they that live godly right all those who are in Christ Jesus shall suffer tribulation there's gonna be hard times it is not easy but who are the promises to? Those who love Christ. And how can we know if we are a lover of Christ? Because it is so easy to deceive yourself. We can know because we keep his commandments. We listen to his word. And his word directs our steps. But yeah, it's interesting and appealing to go do something else. But I can't do that and follow Christ. I can't do the other things that would be interesting and fun and, and uh, perhaps you know, have an alluring effect on my heart that they're pulling on the affections of the old man. But I cannot do that and follow Christ. So at the end of the day, if I have to choose, and I must choose, and I know that the promises of eternal life and of the inheritance and of the kingdom of God and all the things that are spoken of in Scripture are made to those who love him, then I will choose by God's help to love him. That's the choice that must be made. So I'm thankful that I see that. I'm in prayer for each and every one of you that you will continue to the end. And not only so, but that you will grow in your love for Christ. That is what is uh, of the most of all the doctrines we can teach and preach that differentiate between those who are Christ's and those who are not, the most prominent, the most important, the most meaningful, and the most obvious one that is, is that it is mainly this, 
that those who are Christ's love him. They love him. They'll die for him. They'll suffer for him. They'll do whatever is necessary that he asks of them because they love him. You don't have to love what's commanded. I don't know about you, but sometimes what's commanded, it seems unlovable. But that's because we're thinking of it on our terms. When Abraham was called to sacrifice Isaac, that wasn't a thrilling idea to the patriarch, I'm sure. But nonetheless, he loved God more than Isaac. So he got up early the next morning, as Abraham always did when God told him what to do. Got up early, and he went about doing the will of the one he loved and left the rest in his hands. Amen. Brother Adam, if you come.